discipline using only the weapon of love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, uh, I think we can all be thankful for the, the price he paid. He gave his life so that we could have more rights. Hallelujah. For our, our children and our grandchildren and, and many generations before us. Hallelujah. So, um, looking forward to spending tomorrow with my wife and son and, and celebrating the day together. Amen. And uh, we will do that in a very Christian way. Hallelujah. Using the Christian weapons that we have to make our lives better, to make the lives of our communities better, to make the lives of this nation better. Hallelujah. God's given us all the weapons we need. He's given us love that conquers all. Hallelujah. Love that, that can keep moving us in the right direction. Hallelujah. Isn't that powerful? God's love is amazing, and he's given us the weapons to, to move forward because our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and darkness and things that we can come together as a family of Christ and overcome through the power of Christ. Hallelujah. He's already, he's already got us victory, so it's easy. Amen. Hallelujah. We're picking right up where we left off in 1 Corinthians 15. We left off on the 12th verse. Hallelujah. Now, if Christ is being preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? This was a common teaching among a group called the Sadducees. They didn't believe in resurrection of the dead and they're still trying to put this out even after Christ. And Paul's not having it. Hallelujah. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So he's saying your, your theology is messed up. And I want to bring this more than just the teaching of raising the dead. Because when people start to take pieces of the Bible and teach them is not true, or begin to spread misinformation like that, it, it really causes harm to everyone. It causes harm to uh, Christianity in, in the whole world, you know? And we start saying, well, you know, the Bible is not, you know, to be taken literal. It is. <laughs> it's truth. It's the most truth you'll find. Hallelujah. It's much more reliable than the news. It's much more reliable than even science. Hallelujah. It is much more reliable than even mathematics. And that's about as cut and dry and reliable as you can get because his word cannot return to him void. There's no possible way. And since he created all life and all existence and all the space that we have, if his word fails to do that, there is no existence. Hallelujah. <clears throat> And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is futile and your faith is empty. You, know, you can see when you start to take away things that God has done, it, it really it hurts the entire message. You can't just pick and choose. The Bible is what we have to go on. And he's given us our, his Holy Spirit so that we can learn the things that are hard to learn in the Bible. But we have to desire for it. It says if you lack if you lack knowledge, if you lack wisdom, if you lack understanding, ask for it and I'll give it to you freely. You know, it's his great pleasure to give you these things. He doesn't do it and condemn you for not already knowing it or make you feel dumb. He says, I thank you for asking because that shows you care. You know, if you're in a conversation with someone, isn't it great when they ask you questions when they don't understand what you're saying? You know, because why? Because it creates a dialogue, but it also lets them know that they're interested. They want to learn what you have to offer. And that's, that's how our relationship with God is. We have to learn what he has to give us, not just say, I don't understand it, so it's probably not literal, or it's, you know, it's probably not useful, or whatever, or I'm just going to skip these verses. You know, Ask God for understanding on it. Let him give it to you, because every scripture in here is worthwhile, amen, and, and not to be taken out of context, but to be used in the entire story. It's, it's, it's from Genesis to Revelation. There's no 
uh, book that doesn't fit in. It, it all fits in, hallelujah. And it all ties back to Jesus Christ. It points to him from every direction, from the beginning to the end, it's all pointing to him, hallelujah. He is the truth. He is, he is our ministry. If, if, uh, don't be afraid to use his name, hallelujah. Hallelujah, I see people taking way too many precautions now. They're all afraid to be censored. I'm, if you're going to censor me for the name of Jesus, I think you got a bigger hand, fight on your hand than you realize. Hallelujah. You want to unify this nation, come against our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Because we all love him the same. Hallelujah. And that's something that we can all agree on as Christians and church members, wherever you are at, is that we love Christ. And that's why we do this. That's who we are. Amen. And it gives power to our, our preaching and our faith. Hallelujah. When we take the word of God and know that it's true and know what happened. Uh, verse 15. Also, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified against God that he has raised Christ from the dead when in reality he did not raise him if indeed dead are not raised. So he's saying, listen, your, your point's stupid. You're, you're, you're devaluing uh, not just Christianity, but Judaism. You're, you're devaluing everything that we've ever stood for, everything that God has given us. And that's what we do when we take something from the Bible and say it's not useful today or it doesn't still have standing today. We're, we're devaluing everything that God's given us from the beginning to the end. He, he has given us the power to go forward and to overcome but it's through the complete word, not through picking and choosing the word, right? It's, it's from understanding everything. And I know that's a process because there's a lot of information in this Bible that we've been given. There's a lot of revelation that needs to come that, that we can't even understand in our, our carnal mind. But when we let the Spirit teach us, then we understand the things that are deep in the Word, the things that you might not get from the, the written English that you're reading, but that you get from the revelation of the Spirit who teaches you all things. And just as He teaches you through school or teaches you through your workplace or teaches you through your morning routine, He teaches you the Word of God just as well. Hallelujah. And so we need to allow that Holy Spirit to teach us in everything we do. And in that way, we don't get confused. We don't get uh, deceived, but we have a firm foundation in truth and we can walk by that spirit. And when we come up against something we don't understand, we can ask the Holy Spirit to teach it to us. Hallelujah. And, you know, uh, remember it, it, it does, it all comes back to love, but Love, remember, we don't have a, a good definition for it in our language. We don't have a good definition for what it really is when it comes from God, because love is, is greater than anything we can explain with words. It is, you know, it is powerful. It is life-changing. It is forgiving. It is merciful. It is grace. It is everything we need. Hallelujah. It gives us what we need to keep moving forward and what we need to heal ourselves, to heal others, and to heal nations. Hallelujah. That's, that's the power of God in love. It's, it's much more than just being nice to people. Because sometimes love isn't being nice to someone. Hallelujah. You know, if, if my son picked up a sharp knife, I wouldn't just be like, oh, that's okay. You can play with it because I don't want to offend my son. No, I would take it from him because it's a danger to him. That's love because I would keep him from harm. And that's what people don't understand sometimes. Well, we're not supposed to, you know, uh, we're supposed to love everyone. So I'm not going to say anything to this person. No, if God puts it on your heart, then, then allow it to come forth in love. Don't come forth in judgment, come forth in love. It's different, but it, it, it can cause uh, a dangerous situation to dissolve. That's, that's how love works. When, when you're disciplined in love, you know, it changes your life. When you're disciplined in anger, sometimes you're confused and sometimes it just hurts, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, we know that as humans and as parents sometimes, uh, my son is, is way too young to be disciplined, but I tried to tell him when he did something wrong, he's just looking at me like, why, what, huh? You know, he's three months old, and he has no way of understanding that, but 
I wanted to establish that pattern in my life, even though for him it didn't matter. For me, it matters because I need to know how to show him love and discipline. And in no easier way, because I'm not going to spank a three-month-old, hallelujah. I'm not going to, you know, there's, there's not much I can do. And, it, and it's not important that he even learned the lesson, but it was important for me to be able to vocalize that learning, that teaching moment, that I can show love, that I care enough to teach you something, that I care enough to show you something. And that's how God loves us. He cares enough to teach us about his word, about his gifts, about everything he has for us. Whew, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 16, for if the, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So, you know, you can't just pick and choose because that seems like maybe what they were trying to do at this point. What well, Christ was, but no one else will be. Well, you can't just do that because the prophets didn't just prophesy Christ's resurrection. They prophesied all of our resurrection. Hallelujah. We go to sleep in Christ and I'm getting ahead of the message. So, hallelujah. And if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is useless. You are still in your sins. See, we have nothing without the resurrection of Christ. You know, we don't have an altar down here for you to put a goat on and have it be your scapegoat for your sins. We only have one offering, and it's the the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he was the lamb. He was the ultimate scapegoat. He took the sins of the world. Hallelujah. And he put him on himself. And because he had no sin of his own, it could not attach to his soul. So therefore, his spirit was able to revive his soul. Hallelujah. It says uh, the chains of death could not hold him bound. Hallelujah. I love that scripture. Every time I think. And that same spirit, that same spirit that dwelled in Christ Jesus dwells in you and I. Hallelujah. You can get excited about these things. Hallelujah. Furthermore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. See, you see, Paul doesn't use the word perished anymore when he talks about those that are saved that, that uh, are no longer walking among us, right? He says, you know, they're asleep because of the resurrection. They're just waiting to be woken up. Just like Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. Well, he was in a tomb and grave clothes and had stopped breathing and stopped all vital functions for many days at that point. But he was asleep because of the resurrection, because I'm just going to say his name and he's going to wake up because I'm just going to say, get up, get out that tomb. Lazarus, come forth. Right. You know, and that's exactly how it is. He just calls us by name. He knows your name. That's why it's written down. Hallelujah. There's going to be a roll call. And my name's going to be there. And he's going to say, Larry, come forth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 19. For if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we should be pitied more than anyone. So if our hope is only while we walk on earth that Christ is with us, then that, that amounts to nothing. That's a, that's a wasted life. But it's just not the case, is it? Verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. So I told you, when you see that word in the English Bible, but, you can get a little excited. Because <laughs> it's usually coming at you pretty hard. It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those have, that have fallen asleep. Yes. Hallelujah. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. For just as Adam, just as in Adam, all die, so also in Christ, all will be made alive. I have my life, my being in him. Hallelujah. So thankful for that. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then when Christ comes, those who belong to him. Then comes the end where he hands over the kingdom to God the Father when he has brought to an end all rule and all authority and all power. I know that was a lot to read. 
He's the first fruits. And, and here's what you, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I probably am. That's all right. Uh, when he, he says he's the first fruits, he went before us and found salvation for all of humanity. So now that everyone that gets saved is the set aside part that is made holy because you set aside the first fruits. When you set aside the first fruits, you make the rest of your crop holy, or the rest of your money holy, or the rest of your family holy. And see, now you are the first fruits to all those that get saved under your ministry, under your testimony, under your works. So now you become the first fruits to them. Hallelujah. And they become the first fruits to the ones they get saved. Hallelujah. It's just a big Christian pyramid scheme. All right. Hallelujah. With Jesus at the top. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Every enemy in this world will be under his foot. Hallelujah. Every principality, every power is under the foot of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he will reign until that is true. Hallelujah. Until that is seen. Until they have no more rule on earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The very last enemy, verse 26, to be eliminated is death. So when he eliminates death, hallelujah, that's when the resurrection can't help but be stopped. Hallelujah. It's just there. There's nothing to hold you there. There's, there's no principality over death anymore. Now it is just life. It is just truth because it is just Jesus and he has all power and all authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. For he has put everything in subjugation under his feet. Subjection, hallelujah, under his feet. But when it says everything has been put in subjection, it is clear that this does not include the one who put everything in subjection to him. So Jesus was not put into subjection, hallelujah. And when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Hallelujah. See, everything has to come into line. Everything has to come into God's kingdom. You know, that's, that's why we have the, the kingdom teaching today. It's biblical teaching that we, the kingdom of earth is uh, the kingdom of God can be on earth if we allow it to rule. We can walk in it as Christians. We can walk in his kingdom, walk in his authority, walk in his blessing, walk in his power. That's the kingdom of God, and it can be here, but it's, it's not just here yet. Jesus gave us the right to have it here. Hallelujah. That's why you come into a church like this and it, it feels different because the kingdom of God is ruling here. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is ruling here. When you come into your house, it should feel different. The kingdom of God is ruling in my household. The kingdom of God is there. And that's so important. Hallelujah. That is so important to have his rule there because when it's under his subjection, it's under his protection. It's under his ec economy. It's under everything that he holds is now released onto it. All the blessings, all the wealth, all the power that he has is in his kingdom. So when we live in his kingdom, when we walk in his kingdom, when we bring his kingdom with us, hallelujah, because that's how it's called to be. We are supposed to walk and where we step, his kingdom is because I am under subjection to him and I am here as an emissary. Just like if you go into an embassy in a different country, you go into the United States embassy, you are under the full protection of the United States on that embassy. Hallelujah. It is considered, you know, United States ground. It is, it is that. So we are, we are embass embassies walking on earth in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So now where I walk, if I allow it, if I subject myself, if I die daily, if I allow it, then God's kingdom is there with me. And when you touch me, you're touching God's kingdom. When you, when you talk about me, you're talking about God's kingdom. You can't talk about me as a person because that person died when I came to Christ. So now you're, you can't say bad things about someone that doesn't exist anymore because who I am is Christ. 
Hallelujah. That's why it's so hard to hurt the feelings of these people. Hallelujah. Paul was being persecuted every day. Didn't matter, did it? He still went out and preached the gospel because he was in the kingdom. He wasn't himself anymore. He was bought by a price. And he was a Holy Ghost filled man. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Verse 29. Otherwise, what will those who, those, <clears throat> otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? So this is an interesting passage. This is something that uh, was happening in Corinth at the time. Uh, there were those that were lost and never received baptism. And this is neither saying you should do this or you shouldn't do this. This is just something they were doing. So he was using it to make his point. You know, they were being baptized for those that did not get to experience it. Or at least that's the leading theory of where this came from. Hallelujah. Got to get a little teaching in here too, right? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? Why, too, are we in danger every hour? Every day I am in danger of death. I read that wrong. Every day I am in danger of death. Didn't see the exclamation point. Hallelujah. This is as sure as my boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If from a human point of view, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what did it benefit me if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink tomorrow, for tomorrow we die. You know, it's saying, listen, if, if this isn't the truth, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then, then don't live for him. Why are we doing this? It's, it's all pointless. It's all futile. Let's not keep up a charade. But if it's true, if it's true, because I know it's true. Because Paul knew it was true. Because there were witnesses. We talked about the witnesses last uh, Wednesday. Hallelujah. How he appeared before so many after the resurrection. We know that is true. We know that it's evidence. We know that it's one of the best historical accounts. Hallelujah. Of any person from that time. We know it to be true. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Do not be deceived. Hallelujah. See that call right there? Because if God will give us anything we lack, then it's a choice we make to be deceived. If I don't know something, I can ask God. If I don't know something, I can spend time in the word. If I don't know something, I go to him. And instead... So many people choose to be deceived. That's why Paul wasn't putting up with this teaching. Hallelujah. You can see Paul wasn't taking an easy tone with, with the Sadducees right here, was he? Hallelujah. But he was saying, listen, don't be deceived. Don't deceive because you deceive yourself. No, hallelujah. No one's deceiving you. You're choosing to believe in deception. You're choosing to believe in your own condemnation. Hallelujah. If you believe a lie, you will be condemned. Hallelujah. King James says it even harder. Hallelujah. In the same definition, condemned. Hallelujah. We will be condemned if we believe this, if we choose to be deceived. You say, well, I didn't know. Well, you chose not to ask for truth. You chose not to seek truth. You chose not to seek God. Hallelujah. You chose to rely on what you think and what other people think or what the, the mob mentality is. But we got to seek out the one truth, which is Jesus. There was no other. Hallelujah. Paul's not the truth. Peter's not the truth. But Jesus is the truth. Hallelujah. So when we come back to Jesus, we are, cannot be deceived. When everything and every thought we have, that's why every thought is supposed to be held captive by Jesus Christ. When he takes your thoughts captive, how can you be deceived? 
When you put on a renewed mind, how can that mind be deceived if it's brand new? It hasn't learned any, anything wrong because it's new. Stop carrying your old beliefs into your renewed mind because it won't go there. Your mind won't be renewed if you're holding on to the old. Hallelujah. If you're holding on to what isn't true, then God has no place in your life. But when we seek the truth, there's nothing better. When we seek the truth, it convicts us onto righteousness. It brings us into justice. This is God's plan for the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You want a better world for people? It's through Jesus Christ. He was the only one that knew the way. Hallelujah. For people to be treated and honored and respect and to have justice and righteousness abounding. There is, there is only justice and righteousness in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Hallelujah. You can, you can see this today, can't you? We've literally created platforms for bad company to get together. It's called social media. We've created these platforms for bad people to get together, spread deception. I mean, it's, Paul's talking about it before it ever happened, before it ever existed. We get together and we wonder why people that were raised right, people that, that should know God and know the word are being so deceived. It's because bad company corrupts good morals. So you start making bad decisions because not only are you bringing people together with a shield, hallelujah, because you're not face to face, so you'll say worse things about a person. Hallelujah. That's why I just don't post. I just, I am the most boring follow you might ever find because I just stop posting. If I post something, it's a scripture and a picture of my son. So you're welcome. That's a, that's a story because it's not for you, but I like it. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's because you have to understand that, that there is so much that, that can go wrong, but there is so much that goes right with God. There is so much that we have to worry about when we come together and uh, we start to corrupt good morals. We start to have these places where people can go and just talk evil, talk deception, talk lies, and just keep piling it up. And not only that, hallelujah, I know I get back to my main point, but there is actually a reward system built into it. You get more likes, you get more things. And not only is it a reward system on the social platform, but that becomes a reward system. And maybe some of you don't know this in people. It, it actually triggers a dopamine release, just like doing a drug or, or, or smoking a cigarette or anything else. It's the same addiction. It's the same. That's why you see people, they're always on it. They always have to post that one thing because I've got to get five likes today or I'm just not going to make it. I need my fix. Hallelujah. You know, and my fix might come better if I say something inflammatory, if I say something negative, because I'll tell you what, I don't get a whole lot of likes on my Bible verses on my beautiful son. Hallelujah. I get some from other Christians, but I'll tell you what, my non-Christian old friends from high school and things sure aren't liking it. If I was waiting for my fix from that, I wouldn't be getting it. I don't have a fix from my, my, my social group. Hallelujah. And that's, that needs to be all right with Christians. That's not what we're built for. My fix comes from Jesus. You know, uh, we had that go back to the 90s. Uh, we used to talk about being a Jesus junkie. Hallelujah. You know, there's different things like that because Jesus gives us all that we need. Our, when we go to him, you know, we get that same experience in even a greater measure. He, he releases all the things in your body that are good. He knows how your body works, just like he knew where the net needed to be cast for Peter to make the big catch. Huh? 
Hallelujah. You think science knows how your body works. You think medicines can affect your body. You think drugs can affect your body. Think about how the spirit can affect your body, how God can come into your life and start to change depression at the root source. Hallelujah. He knows what's happening with the neurotransmitters. Most medicines, they don't even know how they work. Hallelujah. It's just a guess. That's truth. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Verse 34. Sober up as you should and stop sinning. Stop sinning. Caught the exclamation point that time. Hallelujah. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. I mean, he was writing to Corinth, but it's just as true today. There are people that have no knowledge of God. And even worse today, they have false knowledge of God. And that is to our shame. That is to your shame. Take it personally. That is to my shame. That is to my shame that these people don't know God. They don't know the truth. They don't know the way. They don't know the life. They don't have any inkling of who he really is. They only know the fairy tales that are told on Christmas movies and things of that nature. I mean, come on. There, people know more about the stories that are written in children's books than they know about the stories written in the real word of God. They don't, they don't even know, hallelujah, what the word of God says or how it's powerful, how it can change lives, how it can heal the sick, how it can raise the dead. They don't know that it's true, how it can provide prosperity, how it can get and break off generational poverty, hallelujah, how it can retrain, how your, it can retrain how you think, how you walk, how you act. It can do all of these things, and it is so important. Hallelujah. It is the greatest thing that is in my life is that spirit of God that is in me, that is retraining me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He didn't, he didn't stop when I got saved. That was the starting point. Salvation continually is a work. I'm continually working out my salvation. I, I reverence God. I'm even scared to offend God. I'll take it there. Hallelujah. Not a popular thing. But I'll tell you what, that's how I can work out my salvation before him. Because I know I can't do good enough works. I know that I'm not someone who deserves heaven. If you sinned once in your life, you don't deserve heaven. One time, not even the action, the thought, the very thought. See, we don't hold ourselves responsible for the thoughts we have, but yet the Bible teaches us that we are responsible and we need to give those thoughts to the Lord. Hallelujah. And when we give those thoughts to the Lord, then he begins to retrain the very way the neural connections are made in your brain and you stop having those thoughts. That's how God works. He works at a, a physiological level, not just a spiritual level, because the spirit, hallelujah, makes things alive. So it makes new connections that didn't exist yesterday. When you come to church, you should be ready to have your mind rewired. You should know that there's a new connection that you didn't have before this service. There is something new in your mind in the way you think, the way you talk, the way you walk, everything about you. There is something new because God loves you that much that he took the time to change it in your life because you let him. Hallelujah. Because you submitted to him. Because you said, I am subjected to you, Lord. I come under your rule. I'm in your authority. I'm in your house. Hallelujah. You know, hallelujah. You know, it's, a, it's a great honor to be in his kingdom. It's a great honor to rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. These are the things. But we need to learn how to be kings and royal priests. Hallelujah. It's a promise. That's who we're supposed to be. But are you? Are you really? Would you call yourself royalty right now, how you live, how you walk, how you act, the decisions you make, the way you approach money. But the word of God says we are, if we're in his kingdom, we're spending too much time outside the kingdom. We're spending too much time in the world system. We're spending too much time settling for who we're told we are. 
well, I don't need a man to tell me who I am or a leader and authority to tell me who I am when I've su submitted myself to the most high God and his son, Jesus Christ, is my brother. Hallelujah. Not just my savior. He's my brother, too. I'm family. I've been engrafted in. When you start, when you change how you can see yourself, you begin to change how you feel. You begin to change how you act. You begin to, how to, to change how you talk. You begin to change how you look at money. You begin to change how you look at health. You begin to change how you look at death. You begin to change how you look at life. Because now, what is unexpected and mysterious to the world is known to me through the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which teach me and show me things that are unseen. But how, how much time do we spend looking at the unseen? So how do you look at the unseen? Well, not, not with that mindset, you can't. Not with those eyes, you can't. But when I change my mindset and I open up spiritual eyes, now I see things that no one else sees. Well, hopefully here, everyone sees it, but, you know, in the world, no one sees it. Those that aren't in Christ, they can't see it. They can't understand it. And it can be frustrating. Hallelujah. Sometimes you're trying to talk about spiritual things and you realize that person doesn't have spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, or a spiritual mind. And you're just sitting here like, uh, you want to talk about sports? I don't You know, I just, it gets... You know, it gets nowhere. It's a waste of time. It says, don't cast your pearl before the swine. You know, it's saying, don't cast something of value before someone that doesn't understand the value of it. The pig will just eat the pearls. It doesn't understand that there's value in those. Hallelujah. And it, and it can't learn from it. It's not getting anything. It's not becoming, it's not improving its situation by eating those pearls. Matter of fact, its bodies, even though they can handle everything, it's not going to process it and get any nutritional value out of it. It's just a waste. You've given something that was valuable to something that was unclean and unholy. Remember, the pig is unholy. Hallelujah. It's unclean. It's truth. <laughs> uh, some people are saying, but they're delicious. I don't even remember what they taste like. It's been so long. Hallelujah. Don't miss them. But uh, that's, that's really uh, more for the point of the illustration than anything else. Because sometimes we lose that, that meaning because it's not taught anymore. You know, the reason it was a pig is because it was something that was unclean, unholy. Something, and that's, that's what he's saying. Don't share the wisdom of God, the pearls of wisdom, right? We all know that expression. We relate to that more than we do the pig because it's just not taught as much anymore. We know that we shouldn't waste our God-given things on people that are not holy, that are not set apart. Instead of giving them wisdom, you need to offer them salvation. Because when they have salvation, now you can give them wisdom from God. See, we're called to give that wisdom of God, hallelujah, but after salvation. Hallelujah. Ooh, God's teaching. <clears throat> You know, a lot of times we try to do it backwards. Man's way would be to give them the wisdom of God and convince them. But God's way isn't. It's to give them salvation and experience, and then you can give them the wisdom to grow and develop. We try to win a debate with someone that can't understand the things we're saying. It's ridiculous. You know, uh, I'm much more educated than my son, but I can't win a debate with him. He doesn't understand a single word I say. He's three months old. He doesn't know. He, I, can, I can give him the most valuable information in the world, and he can look at me and give me a little toothless grin, and that's about it, because <laughs> there is nothing, hallelujah, nothing that he can gain from that experience, that moment. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. So sober up as you should and stop sinning. Hallelujah. For some have no knowledge of God, and I say this to your shame. Hallelujah. So that's our commission to go out into this week and, and begin to share the knowledge of God. You know, 
the gospel is the basis of it. If you if it, you can't share the gospel, you can't give wisdom outside of the gospel before they receive that. The gospel is the salvation that we offer. Make them understand the truth of it. Read with them. Tell them, hey, you want to read through John? I'll read it with you. We can talk about it every day. If it's someone you see every day, make, a, make it fun. Make it, make it your conversation. I mean, how many times... How many topics do you really have to talk about with the same people every day? I mean, sometimes you're working at the same job for 20, 30 years, seeing the same people day in and day out. But if you get a Bible plan together, now all of a sudden you have someone to talk about First John with. Now, oh no, we got to John 3.16. It's going to be a good day. You know, you got, a, you got something to look forward to. You've retrained your mind while offering salvation to someone. They might not get saved, but at least you've done your job. Your job is not to save them, it's to share and spread the gospel. We get, it, we get down because uh, no one's getting saved. No, Jesus saved them. That's his job. He's the only one that can, the only one that will. Your job was to go and spread the gospel. You know, Don't take on a burden that wasn't yours, but don't lay down the burden that is. Let us... Share the gospel. Let us bring people to the gospel. Let us bring them through the, the gospels. Hallelujah. All four gospels and the book of Acts. I really believe you need to needs to be taught together. Amen. It's the continuation of the book of Luke. So it really is part of the gospels. I don't care. <laughs> it's just the truth. Amen. It's it's a good way to do it and it shows where you're gonna end up next. And from there you can share all the wisdom of God. You can open their spiritual eyes, you can open their hearts, and you can change the way they think, the way they act. Because it's, that's not what it's about. Sharing the gospel is not about getting someone to stop sinning. It's about sharing the knowledge of God. Let salvation do its work. Let the Holy Spirit convict onto righteousness. We get so caught up on doing things we're not responsible or, or capable of doing. Hallelujah. Some of us think we're experts in every area because of God, when you haven't learned a single area of God yet to share. But let's see our burden and, and share the gospel with the, with the world. And it's up to them. If they don't accept it, don't be mad or discouraged. But no, guess what? There's someone next door. There's another person right there. It says, shake off the dust from your boots and go on. You know, it's so don't give it another thought. It's not supposed to be a lifelong journey to get one person saved. It's supposed to be a lifelong journey of sharing the gospel with, with as many as you can. As many that will hear it, then share it. Because sometimes the person you think that doesn't want to hear it is the one that wants it the most. And they're just better at hiding it than most people. And then, hallelujah. And some, but sometimes we get so caught up, don't we, on that one person. And, you know, that's a trick from the enemy. They, the enemy wants to steal your time because time is limited. We only have so many days we walk on this earth as human beings. And that time is limited. And if he can steal you your time, I mean, come on, we've all had this moment. You spend so much time working with a person and, and nothing changes and nothing changes. And really, God's saying, go out to the masses and, and spread the gospel, you know, to, to 30 people. And you've spent 30 years on one person, you know, instead of 30 people in one week, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trap of the enemy that we need to recognize. We're being deceived and we don't know it because we haven't asked God. We get so caught up on a person instead of on God's people. Everyone on earth is God's people. They don't have to look like you, talk like you, go to the same school as you, but you know what? They deserve the knowledge of God just as much as you did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't think I want to go any further tonight in the word. Hallelujah. We went through 22 uh, verses there. That was a lot. So go back, read over it. I went through some of it fast. Didn't touch any of the eschatology teaching in there because we'd really be here all night. Hallelujah. And, and quite honestly, I'm not prepared for it either. So, all right. Uh, so uh, I love you all. 
Thank you for being here and part of this teaching. But take that commission with you. Jesus gave us that commission and never died to go out and share the gospel. Hallelujah. Find yourself a, a good accountability partner because that's what it is, two by two, and go and share the gospel. Amen. Amen. Don't get caught up trying to do the whole work of salvation. That's not your job. Share the gospel. God might have you do something for a person, a new believer and, and things like that, but that's not your job. That's not the commission. You know, That's just part of your growth. That's part of your ministry. But we need to really focus on the commission that was given to each of us is to just go and share the gospel, the truth of it. Be well equipped. Amen. You might think, man, I need, to read it. I need to read the gospel again. You're right, you do. Because I don't care how many times you've read it, you can read it again. I don't think any of you can re quote the entire gospels. You know, if you don't know it all, then there's more to learn, isn't there? Amen. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to share the gospel effectively. Lord Jesus, let us not fall into traps. Let us not fall into temptations. And surely keep us from deception, Lord. We give your Holy Spirit complete control to convict us onto righteousness, to keep us from going into bad situations. Open our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, reach reshape our mind, renew our mind, Lord Jesus. We thank you for these things. These are your words, so we know you will do it because you have already proclaimed that you would. And your word does not return to you void, Lord Jesus. We thank you for lighting a spark inside of us, Lord, so that we can shine as you have called us to shine, not hidden under a bushel, but on a lamppost as a light unto the city. We thank you, Lord, for that call. We thank you for that ability. It's not our own. It is yours. The grace we were given was not earned, but given to us. Hallelujah. From you, Lord Jesus. We understand that it is not by our works or by our desire, but it is by your works and your desire, Lord, that this world is saved. And we give you all praise and honor and glory for that. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for tuning in to our stream. However, this brings a conclusion to our service. We would like to invite everyone to help us out by making any donations as you please, as they do help us to continue our ministry. If you would like to send a gift online, donations can be made using the donate button at our website, faithtemplebg.org, or if you would prefer to send something in the mail, all checks or money orders can be written to Faith Temple and can be mailed to the address 175 State Street in Bowling Green, Ohio, zip code 43402. We really do appreciate any and all gifts sent in. We thank you for tuning in to our stream, and we hope to catch you on the next one. We love you, and God bless.